I would like to start off today's program by saying how grateful I am to be living, teaching, and learning on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, and that it's by incorporating those best practices that they help inform us with of oral history, storytelling, and observation that both OceanWise Research and education can really connect to programs like this and share the great work that we're doing each and every day. We're really excited to be looking locally today at How Sound and the great work that Laura has been doing and connecting to biodiversity. And this is such a perfect presentation for September, as it is actually Biodiversity Month for Science Literacy. And so we're really excited to be connecting with you and taking all of your comments and questions throughout the program. And so with further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our research biologist, Laura Borden. Thank you so much. I am just going to share my screen here. Let's see. There we go. That should be in uh, full full frame for you guys. Um, thank you so much. I, it's a uh, it's a real pleasure to to be here and share a little bit about some of the research I've done and and our program as a whole. And I just learned something new in the fact that it's Biodiversity Month for Ocean Literacy. So that's fantastic. Um, I think it's a good way to 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 kick off the uh, kick off September. Um, so I thought today that I would talk a little bit about um, what our program, the Ocean Biodiversity Research Program, has been doing for the last 40 years at, at, um, at OceanWise here, and also to talk a little bit about how that fed into some of the research that I did for my master's degree um, with OceanWise uh, studying kelp. So um, we'll go forward. Oh, I'm just having an issue getting it to, there we go. Okay, all good. You guys can see that now. Um, yeah, so as I said, you know, biodiversity, it's in, it's in our program name and it's, it's a big um, area of study for, for our program and has been for over 40 years. Um, we've, uh, we've collected and collated information on species abundance and, and location um, within how sound and the broader um, BC coast for for 40 years and a lot of time that's sort of that's sort of the background work that our program has done you know we are we are in the field um, all year round and working on various different projects but one of those key pieces that's been consistent through through the history of our program is collecting that baseline information and for a lot of projects it becomes including mine it becomes the foundation from you know how we ask those questions and the the different areas of research that that we get interested in. Um, of course, as I said, you know we've also had lots of short-term focus projects in our program, and my research uh, was one of those. Um, we've also recently we worked on a project um, with art students in developing and building sculptures to be able to put into the water um, to create rockfish habitat. Um, over the last few years. We've also worked with various students to look at how we can take technology and create 3D maps of, of glass sponges, a really incredible habitat that we've studied for a number of years here in Howe Sound. Um, and then, yeah, kelp and, and following on the heels of sea star wasting disease uh, was another area of research for myself and uh, one of my colleagues during our master's degrees. Um, and we've also looked at things like rockfish um, size and abundance and diversity studies. And oftentimes these focus projects sort of tie us in um, to, you know, it becomes what we're looking at and studying and in the field look, um, doing for a, a large chunk of time. But as I said, one of the great things is that background biodiversity data collection that's kind of always happening for us um, and has been valuable to a lot of different researchers at OceanWise and and, and abroad. Um, and for me, what I wanted to talk about today is how that kind of fed into the research that I've done on kelp. 
So I want to talk about the story of rocky reef communities. In House Sound, this is really the dominant habitat type that we see. And um, for those who are familiar, um, a number of years ago in 2013, um, we saw the almost the complete die off of what we have here, the Pycnopodia or sunflower sea star. And they went from this incredible abundance to almost, uh, it'd be amazing to see one on a dive. Um, and the result of that was, was that our urchin population or our grazers kind of, kind of exploded. And that plays into what happens to our kelp because these grazers consume our kelp for us. Um, and so what I'm showing here in the graph is just really what that baseline biodiversity monitoring showed us. And that was that we could go back 30 years to 1990 in this case and look at, you know, the, the, how those abundances had changed over time, just observationally. And, um, as you can see, kind of right from about 2014 onwards, the orange, orange bar there is showing that just absolute unprecedented explosion of green urchins that we saw. And it was um, a really dramatic shift in, in that rocky reef community. All of a sudden, there was no, no sunflower stars and these urchins took off. And so the result was that we were seeing the disappearance of these kelp beds. And kelp is such an important habitat. Um, it, they provide habitat for a huge diversity of life. Um, in House Sound, they happen to be um, the, the settlement habitat for spot prawns, which are such a commercially important species. Um, and so to see the decline in that habitat was really concerning. So my, my goal in my research was really to look at that particular habitat from the perspective of kelp and how this shift was going to, going to impact uh, the persistence or, or potential return um, of kelp and house sound. So just to kind of paint a little picture about what this cast, when we talk about cascading effects or, or what the implications of sea star wasting disease were on the community. Um, we had traditionally in, in house sound, we have sunflower stars as the top predator and they often are controlling the abundance of green urchins. And you'll, sometimes you'll see them consume them as well. Um, and these green urchins graze on what is our um, most abundant species of kelp in house sound, and that's um, the fringe sea colander kelp. Um, and as I mentioned, this has a positive impact on our sprout prawn population because it's really critical settlement habitat for juveniles. And so as a result, when we saw what happened with sea star wasting disease, we see this um, dramatic um, negative impact that urchins are having on kelp. And so that, that positive effect of kelp on, on spot prawns is really quite diminished in this case because we're just losing the habitat and, and these, these spot prawns have nowhere to develop from juveniles to adults before they reach the commercial population. So just to give you another visual of really what that looked like underwater, because uh, that's really, really, um, really tells the story very well is, and we went from these, these kelp beds and the fourfold increase in green, green urchins that uh, my colleague documented, it led to this significant decline in kelp cover following the sea star wasting disease. And a lot of our reefs nowadays even still um, are just covered by green urchins. And I'm sure if you're a diver, you probably witnessed this uh, throughout um, throughout how sound and you'll still still see kelp beds in some places where they haven't taken over but more often than not in the shallows we're seeing a lot of green urchins and that hasn't changed a whole lot in the last um, seven years so what I wanted to do in my research I'm going to talk about one part of that was I wanted to look at how biomass loss of kelp was affected by the density of urchins because that's really what changed is all of a sudden we we've always had urchins and they've certainly always always been around and i'm sure divers see them on practically every dive um but uh but we were seeing this this huge density increase in urchins so i was looking at how that affected the rate of kelp loss uh, because really it's a it's a, a between whether kelp can grow and maintain its its size fat faster than, than urchins can graze it down. So what I did was I took some kelp, some um, fringe sea colander from probably the one really healthy bed that I could find 
And um, I transplanted this to some reefs where um, there was just, it was just an urchin barren and there was no other kelp. And um, I attached these blades to, to a chain and I left them there for 24 hours. And I measured the density of urchins at the start and the end of the experiment, just so I had a, a general idea of how much that changed over the course of 24 hours. And then I collected all that stuff from underwater and I took a whole bunch of photos of what the kelp looked like before and after to see if we could look at exactly how much tissue was lost over a short period of time um, with urchins grazing on it. Um, and, if, and I'm just showing you here in one of the photos, I had the little, I created a little mesh uh, protection for one of my blades so that it could, could be a nice control for me in that experiment. So that's what the strange thing coming up off the chain is there. <laughs> Um, so I really, I love talking about this because it's really great when you can have photos that just show what dr the dramatic effect was. So on um, my left, I think that's your left too, um, the density of urchins uh, between 10 and 20 per meter square, you can see the before and after. I'm pointing out with that arrow a little bit, um, a little bit of, a little bit of tissue damage from urchins. But you can tell it's not really dramatic between the two. There's not a lot of change in, in tissue um, over the course of 24 hours. But then when we collected some of the blades that were chewed down by urchins that were at a higher density of 20 to 30, you can see a really clear indication that there's some significant kelp tissue loss just in 24 hours at that sort of density. And um, what I found particularly cool about this experiment was you can even see they chew out these little like star shaped holes um, and that's really a marker of, of urchins and so it was easy to identify their grazing effect on the kelp. Um, and it's also just fun to try and take a lot of photos of these kelps and then and then I had to circle and measure all the areas to to get the changes. So what I found, um, what I'm showing here is really that as our density of urchins increase, the biomass loss um, of kelp, it increased over time. But as you can kind of see, that's not linear. It doesn't just keep going up. The more urchins you add, it doesn't equate to the same amount of kelp loss. Um, so there was certainly even just above about 30 urchins per meter square, we had over 50% of kelp tissue loss in 24 hours. So that was quite a significant, um, significant amount of loss. But at the higher densities, over 40, 50, 60 urchins per meter square, it actually didn't increase a whole lot anymore. And I thought, oh, well, I'm not sure why that is. Like, what's, what's happening that's caused the urchins to not be grazing down as much when they're such high densities? So one of the things I looked at, um, I know there's a lot, of, a lot of dots and a lot of information on this slide, but um, the top graph is really showing that the rate of consumption for urchins of the tissue um, is it's not increasing at a one-to-one -one rate, which is what I was seeing in that other plot. So every time you add an urchin, you're not getting the equivalent amount of, of tissue loss. And the reason for that is really what's in our second graph there. And this is our per capita grazing rate. So what that means is basically um, that it's how much kelp a single urchin is eating based on how many other urchins are around them. And so what we saw was that there's actually this interference or this intraspecific interference um, uh, with the urchins. So when they're at really high densities, they actually just, they're on top of each other and they can't get at the kelp tissue, so they don't eat it as, as, uh, as much. Um, and so that was what kind of explained why the grazing rate um, and the amount of tissue lost at really high density densities wasn't what I thought it would be in, in terms of being a linear increase over time. So, what we were addressing with this question really was what happens when we have so many urchins and how does the density affect the rate of kelp loss? So really there were two big questions or two big um, take homes from that experiment. And the first one was that the grazing rate, it declines at high densities of urchins. So we don't get that linear increase. And that there might be at that around 30 to 40 urchins 
there might be some sort of that might be our tipping. So when we think about, you know, how much do we need to decrease the urchin population in order to see kelp come back and be able to persist? So that may be one of our that may be our threshold. So um, which is it's important to have an idea of what that threshold is. But for anyone who's been out in house down and diving, we know that the densities of urchins are far, far above that. So we're talking about a really dramatic shift in order to transition from these urchin barrens back to back to kelp beds. So between the research that I did on this particular aspect and some ecology work that I did to understand how kelp the kelp grows, um, the really big thing that I found from all this research was that with the current densities of urchins and, and kelp growth is just simply not likely to outpace the way that, that urchins can devour kelp. Um, and so we're not really at a point where we're gonna see by nature at least um, some dramatic shift back to healthy kelp beds. So it wasn't really like a very positive message to come away with unfortunately, but it was informative. Um, and so where that leads us is to what can we do or what needs to change in order to have kelp flourish again in in-house sound. And there's one of two things is that we either work to control the population um, um, through uh, experimentation and removal um, of urchins, or we need to see some sort of return of our top predator to rebalance this ecosystem, to rebalance the community dynamic and, and have more Pycnopodia. But of course, I, as I mentioned off the top, we haven't really seen a huge increase in that predator um, in the last seven years. So, but there's not, there's not no hope for this. And that's really, I wanna talk next about what are the next steps and what are we doing as a program to kind of build off of this research and 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 see if what the potential is for Pycnopodia to return. So one of the projects that um, we've started working on recently um, that my colleague Fiona Francis is leading up and is looking at sunfl sunflower star reproduction timing and status. And this is really interesting because if you remember at the beginning, I was talking about how important that baseline monitoring is to provide the perspective on on what we have seen in history and how species abundances have changed. Well, we were one of the few programs that actually could go back that far and provide that kind of information on sea stars and kelp and this, that system. Because what happens when you have invertebrates as cool as I think sea stars are, not everybody does. And, <laughs> and sometimes um, we just don't really know how they reproduce or when that happens or, or, or that really that ecological information about the species. And so that's what we're hoping to do next is to understand a little bit more about the ecology of this top predator so that this can inform some recovery strategies for the species. Because I think at the end of the day, that's gonna be what's gonna have the most sustainable impact on, on seeing a rebalance of this, of this community. And so, you know, we're gonna continue to monitor how things develop and change in terms of abundance of these species in house sound, but um, and that that'll that'll play an important role in, in giving us perspective and and again, you know, when when things change, we'll be there to be able to provide that that background knowledge and information. Um, but yeah, it's really exciting and it's nice to see you know build off of some of the work that I did in on kelp and and it's a really interesting story and it's. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited to share that with you. And uh, yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed some of that and learned a little bit. Um, and yeah, if any questions you guys have, I'm happy to answer. Wonderful, thank you so much, Laura. It was really great to learn about the work that you've done and some of those kind of questions that are coming up next. Uh, have you been getting out and diving recently? We have. We were actually just in the field on yesterday. Yesterday we were. Um, yeah, so we were not out diving for a few months for till August. 
Um, but we have been out and uh, we've been trying to find some sites for our project looking at sea star populations. So we've been to a few great places that um, have some, some good adult size uh, sea stars. Wonderful. And I think that's a, maybe a great next question is sunflower sea stars, the adults were quite large, um, but what sort of things do you need to look at to see if they're coming back? What do you need to keep an eye out for? Kind of what size animals are you looking for in the environment? Yeah, yeah so we, um, we've been tracking uh, the, the sizes and often we'll see small baby ones that might be four or five centimeters in diameter. Um, so the ones that we kind of classify as around juvenile age probably are between 10 and 20 centimeters in diameter. And then anything over 20 is kind of our benchmark for an adult. But as I said, like there's, you know, we don't really have a great background of ecology on this species. Um, so we're still, you know, learning to define that a bit, but that's really what we're looking for when we search for adults for our study. Awesome. Yeah, definitely kind of a different size of animal to keep an eye out for, for sure. Uh, so some questions that are coming in from our audience, and definitely I encourage our audience to send lots our way, is kind of what other predators might you find in the environment that would consume urchins in urchin barrens? One was, you know, we know that sea otters often eat these animals, but we're probably not going to find them in this particular area. Yeah, I don't think we've ever really seen, I don't think sea otters have ever existed in, in these inside waters before. So that's unfortunately not gonna be one of the possible solutions. Um, there are other species, uh, large species of sea star, um, such as uh, the sun star, the, the sun star, um, uh, striped sun star will we'll consume these as well. And uh, wolf eels will eat urchins, although I have to say, I don't know of a ton of wolf eels in my town, but there are some. Um, but yeah, those are really the two main ones that um, consume urchins that we kind of have in these, in these waters. And I guess with the kind of loss of kelp in the area, these barrens are pretty exposed from some of your photos that you've shown. So does that tend to make other predators kind of scarce once you get to such an open area? Yeah, um, I mean, as one of my favorite things is to dive in kelp beds because of the amount of biodiversity that you'll find in there. You'll often find um, juvenile fish and little baby rockfish in there. And so with that um, barren, barren reef, you're not really seeing as nearly as much of that and um, not as many, necessarily as many predatory fish if there isn't, if there isn't food for them. Right. Um, and I think a great question just that came in was also about the term reef. And so a lot of people kind of associate reef with almost coral reefs. Um, could you describe kind of what the definition of a reef is and why this area is considered reefs as well? Yeah, that's a good question. I've never, I've actually never thought of it. I think, um, I think I just used the term really just to describe the type of habitat because it's something other than, other than a sandy bottom. But uh, the photo that I have up on the screen, actually, it's it's from the Arctic, but it's also a rocky reef. Um, and it's really just often a combination of bedrock and boulders, and then all that growth of kelp or otherwise that might be on there. Um, but yeah, reef can be a pretty broad term. We use it for rocky reefs. Um, you'll see that there's lots of rocky reef habitat along the Pacific Northwest. Um, but even in our program, you know, we use that to describe um, glass sponge reefs. Uh, which is just another type of habitat. It's sort of a continuous habitat that all sorts of life lives on. And so, yeah, I guess it's just a general term. That's a really interesting question, though. 
Excellent. I definitely encourage all of our audience to check out the glass sponge reefs that we do have here in How Sound. There's a great Tales from the Deep episode available on our YouTube channel. So shameless plug to go check that out um, and to learn a little bit more about that really unique animal that we have here. Um, and to yeah, explore all those different kinds of reefs that we might be referring to. Um, I really kind of like this next question, and I definitely associate a lot of different types of ocean animals with seafood. And so our audience is asking that, you know, in their experience, some sea urchins found on these barrens have kind of, I guess, are smaller or maybe have low amounts of uni um, in their words inside them that make them less appealing to humans as their predators as a fishing spot and is there any um, kind of information i guess that maybe this would impact whether predators would be interested in hunting on these barrens if it's a lower food source for them yeah um that's a great question um that's certainly true that that it's one of the wonders of urchins as much as I don't like that they destroy kelp, but they're really incredible animals um, and they can, they can really starve themselves. And that's what happens. And that's why the, the uni or the gonads of the, of the urchin shrink in size and they can just starve themselves for a very long time until they find a good food source again. And um, I know that there's been, you know, work along the Pacific coast, including California and such to look at ways to control urchin populations by building the market for, for uni and, and that sort of thing. Um, but of course, when you have the shrinking gonads of, of urchins, it's less a, less value for, for fishermen or, or divers who are catching these to, to sell in commercial markets. So um, in terms of it being less appealing as a food source to predators, I, I, I think when it comes to some of those animals that are gonna eat the urchins, that that's certainly a consideration because they've got to tear those those um, shells or tests apart to access the, the actual meat of the animal. Um, but there's so many around that I think um, it is probably not too much of a concern for some of the main predators. Excellent. Thank you so much for answering that so well. I actually never really considered that they, as they starve, that, you know, their body mass would shrink as well. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, Going back to some of the work you talked about in terms of kind of transplanting uh, kelp for your research, I guess the great question is kind of, can you transplant kelp and did it keep growing where you moved it or was it kind of, um, you know, settled there? I know you had it on some chains and with some mesh, um, kind of what are the opportunities around that? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question because um, in that experiment, I was only keep, keeping them temporarily there and removing them. So, um, and it was on a, a heavily um, a heavily urchined reef. So they were they were going to consume that if I left it there. But transplanting kelp is certainly one of the ways that we can think about restoration if opportunities. And and that's something that our program at OceanWise in general is really interested in. Is is how can we um, actually restore these types of habitats and is it possible? Um, and there are ways to do that through seeding brand new kelps there, but transplanting is also a really good um, opportunity and possibility. Um, we haven't done any transplanting ourselves, but that is certainly one of the things that um, should we consider doing some restoration activities related to kelp, um, that would be a great way to go because we do have some healthy kelp populations. Um, of the sea colander in house sound that could act as as um, as transplants for some of these barren reefs. That's definitely something to look forward to. And I have to say, probably one of my favorite things to find on a beach walk are kelp hold fast. And so I encourage our audience to keep an eye out for those or search up hold fast if you are 
uh, new to that term, as it's a really neat way of kind of learning a little bit about kind of the physiology of kelp and how they work and how they anchor themselves in different areas without a traditional kind of plant root system. Um, so here's a question specifically for you, Laura, um, is that, you know, obviously this research takes a lot of diving to perform. And were you a diver first and then a researcher or a researcher that then got into diving because of the type of work you were doing? That's a good question. Um, I always I always feel bad answering this in, in, because I I feel so lucky and so privileged to be able to do it do this to die for, for work and, and for it to be my job. But I um, actually started as a researcher. And then when this opportunity presented itself to, to do some uh, field work and participate in it, I actually went out and got dive certified. So I'm in no way a recreational diver and I don't come from that background at all. Um, but I've done over about 650 scientific dives. Um, so I really, I really got into it for the research aspect rather than being a diver and then a scientist. Nice. Uh, well, I mean, that's, I think, a great way to, you know, open doors for your research to kind of follow where it takes you and that you can always learn those skills, as well as I think we have a lot of recreational divers that uh, tune into our programs and um, I myself am a recreational diver and so it's always really neat to kind of be able to connect to those different opportunities too, whether it's in a community or citizen science format. Um, and there's some great questions coming in too about, you know, are there some opportunities for the community to get involved in citizen science reporting or even kind of youth and younger people to keep an eye out for these changes in biodiversity in how sound and their community? Yeah, absolutely. There's there's lots of ways to get involved. And um... Our program specifically, we've run a couple of citizen science diver surveys for the last um, couple of decades now, um, studying uh, lingcod, surveying lingcod egg mass uh, when they spawn in the winter time. And that's been a really popular survey since uh, 1994 that uh, lots of divers in the community participate in. Um, another one that we do that's happening right now until the end of October is our rockfish abundance survey. And so we get divers to submit um, uh, surveys that they've done of the rockfish populations um, up and down the BC coast, wherever they're diving, Washington as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we're working to right now actually really to, to strengthen our citizen science program because that's really a huge piece of the research that we do. And, and being able to gather so much data is, is, comes from, from the community doing that. Um, and then in terms of younger people or non-divers uh, participating and contributing to the science, um, you know, I even just yesterday got an email asking a question about some sea stars that had washed up on shore and died suddenly the other day in West Vancouver, and they wanted to know if we do anything about it or, or whatnot. So that's really a great way for, for the community that's not diving to also participate is, you know, report those unusual events that you see and and send us photos of those and we can hopefully provide insight or maybe it'll be an alert to us about something that's going on in, in our local waters and we can follow up on. So there's, there's lots of great ways for the community to participate. Wonderful and absolutely, yeah, I think that you know, concept of, you know, noticing those changes and being able to send it in, take a picture if you can, is a really great way because, you know, there's just so many more eyes out in the environment when we get that citizen um, and community science involved. And so that's a great way to go. We have been doing a lot of work with some of our citizen science um, apps like iNaturalist, and they have a new one called Seek by iNaturalist that you can always check out and download on your phone, which again, just helps communicate to the whole citizen science community, identifying what you're seeing and connecting to those different projects, all part of that biodiversity month that we're seeing happening in September right now. So I'll post a few links as we get to the end um, for some of those tools that just help 
that out. And so if people did want to send in information to you, Laura, what, how could they get a hold of you? Who should they contact? Yeah, any of those, um, any of those surveys, any of the rockfish survey or link cod survey, um, you can check out our website, the research.ocean.org. And um, you can navigate to our, our How Sound program. Um, and we've got a page for each of those surveys and any kind of additional citizen science diving um, surveys that we have will all be available through that website. Um, and also you can, you know, if you're if you're seeing unusual things in your in your shorelines or want to report any unusual observations, um, you can send those into uh, research at ocean.org as well. And then, you know, if it's uh, whale related or invertebrate related, that'll reach the right researchers here at OceanWise to, to help figure out and, and address that question. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, so research at ocean.org is a great email address to use. Um, and I will add a link in the chat in just a moment to our research page. So you can go check that out. Um, and the there's a few questions kind of coming in that we're really excited to see some of the communications that has been coming out about the new Ocean Watch report. And Laura, did you want to share a little bit about how you've been involved the past couple of weeks or even long before that in that project. Yeah, um, that's a, a so great, great, grateful somebody mentioned that. Um, yeah, that's been a project that uh, started about 18 months ago. And, and this was an update um, to an original report um, produced in 2017. And the Ocean Watch report is really interesting and great because it's about bringing together the science and the community, um, both you know, scientists and citizen scientists, um, to tell the story and update about you know what is happening with different species and habitats and what's the health of all of these different components of our marine environment. And this report um, that was released on I think August twenty seventh, we had our first release event for it. Um, that was. Um, summarizing for how sound all of these characteristics, including things like critical fish stocks. So that's some of our rock fish and lingcod data went into informing that. Um, we talked, there was an article about glass sponge reefs and um, biodiversity monitoring. And so those are some of the ones that we contributed it to, but there's also a variety of other topics from marine birds to um, the social sciences outside of outside of the community. Um, so it's it's a really it's a really great um, resource for understanding the health of how sound in general and all these different characteristics that play a role in that. Um, so it's a really great way to bring all that information together and share that with people. Um, and my colleague Aroha Miller is the individual who who tirelessly put that together and did such a wonderful job. And I think there's some um, some education toolkits for it, and there's um, we're connecting with with our um, with government and, and all levels of the community to really um, help that inform conservation that needs to happen in house sound. Excellent. And thank you so much for mentioning the toolkit. I just popped the link in the chat there as well, is that we do have a kind of educator's guidebook and student workbook that connects classrooms to that new Ocean Watch report. And that's all online now. And so it's a great way that you can kind of start that conversation with students if you're a teacher starting out the school year this year, um, and you can always find the details of that at our education.ocean.org slash teachers page. All of the resources are online there for you. And so we're just coming up kind of near the end of the program. So if anyone has any last questions that they'd like to put in the chat for Laura, um, one of kind of my favorite questions ask all of our presenters is sort of, you know, how did you get in to research? Do you have any advice for kind of our audience of budding scientists? 
That's a great question. Um, I, I kind of want to say I fell into it, but <laughs> that's not really a helpful answer. Um, no, I, I was always really interested in science. And um, when I studied at university, I when I was finishing up, I didn't know, you know, how do you make that bridge between studying science in university and then actually having a career in that. And um, there was an opportunity through some um, science grants with the government to apply and work with the, with the aquarium for 16 weeks on a grant. And so I thought, well, I grew up in Vancouver and the aquarium's a cool place. So I, I took that opportunity and then, uh, well, I think everybody who works here kind of knows once you're, once you're in, you're, you're hooked and you just kind of love all the things about it. And, and um, I've kind of gotten to grow through this program and, and I got to do my master's um, while working here and, and learn those skills. So, so that was a, that was a great thing. Wonderful. And I think that's, you know, great advice is to be curious and explore all those opportunities. And even if something maybe starts off short term, it could always grow into something more. And I think that is uh, so true, definitely for myself and lots of other folks that work for OceanWise and the Vancouver Aquarium is that it definitely kind of hooks you and you want to stay on in all the many different ways that you can. So thank you so much, Laura. I'm going to just switch screens here over to talk a little bit about what's coming up next for Tales from the Deep and for our online programs coming up this month. And for our audience, if you'd like to put in the chat any thank yous or your favorite part of today's presentation, we'd love to see that coming in as well. So coming up next week, we have a great kickoff to Sea Otter Awareness Week that's starting on September 20th. And so we're going to be connecting to Rachel Nelson all about a sea otter's life from rescue to rehabilitation. So if you're joining us today or you want to help spread the word about what's coming up next, we'd love to see you online with us at 1 p.m. next Thursday for our Tales from the Deep presentation. Every week you can follow along to see what's coming up next with Tales from the Deep by following us at OceanWise on Facebook under our events tab. You'll see all the information that you need. You'll get handy reminders of what's coming up each week and you can always help share it to your friends and family if you'd like to help us spread the word and see what's going on with this great program. We also have some exciting special presentations starting at the end of September featuring our winners from the Ocean Research Awards that happened in June this past spring. And so we're going to be having some new faces and great stories to learn from at the same time. Again, we're looking forward to Science Literacy Month as well as Sea Otter Awareness Week. And so we have a special online event coming up on September 22nd, which is going to feature a new book, Kalan and the Stink Inc. with the author, illustrator, and our very own Marine Mammal Res Rescue Center manager, Lindsay Ackhurst, who's going to be sharing all about the great work that we do there. And there's a fundraiser going on right now that when you purchase the book, $5 goes towards fundraising for the Marine Mammal Rescue Center and helping with a lot of the great work that's going on locally. And as I said, it is Biodiversity Month. And so you can always check out Backyard Bio um, or hashtag backyard bio on social and follow along. There's some great kind of challenges, some ways to get involved, posting photos, sharing what you're seeing. And so we really look forward to getting involved and connecting to biodiversity, not only in Canada, but around the rest of the world. And as you've probably seen, there's lots of 
lots going on in the media right now about the recent closure of the Vancouver Aquarium. This is so that we can enter a phase of transformation and look to kind of how we can reinvent the Vancouver Aquarium that has held such a special place in so many people's hearts and lives for the past 64 years. And so you can always check out the vanaqua.org slash support slash community to see how you can connect to us, support the Vancouver Aquarium and OceanWise so that we can continue with this great research and education and conservation initiatives that we have going on. And of course, education and online learning is continuing on throughout the entire school year. And so you can keep up to date with what we have in the works by following us on Twitter at OceanWise EDU or heading to education.ocean.org. And so we really thank you for coming in and joining us this afternoon and connecting to Laura. Thank you so much Laura, for your wonderful presentation. And we look forward to seeing everyone again next week. Bye.